Uh, good morning. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the place in which we work and study is situated within the traditional unceded lands of the Ganegaaga or Mohawk peoples, part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This is also a strong, there is also a strong historic presence of Anishinaabe peoples in what is now known as the Greater Montreal Area. Jajake, or Montreal, has long been and continues to be a gathering place for many First Peoples from all directions. We honor and thank the traditional custodians of this land and strive to work for the success of future generations. On behalf of the Vanier College English Department, I would like to welcome you to Who's Freedom, Art, Text, and Expression in the Public Domain, our 10th annual symposium. During this three-day event, we are presenting a wide variety of speakers, performers, activists, and writers exploring the impact of language and voice. We'll be asking tough questions such as whose voice deserves to be listened to and amplified, what are the consequences of pushing aside those stories we don't want to hear, and how can language be a tool to empower or to imprison? This event would not be possible without the support of numerous collaborators. Thus, the symposium organizing committee would like to thank the Faculty of General Education, the Faculty of Arts, Business, and Social Science, Vanier's Director General and Academic Dean, Vanier's Communications Office, the Vanier College English Department, the SCI Office, Vanier's Indigenous Studies Program, the Student Services, the VTV, our many speakers and performers, and of course, you, our wonderful audience. Before I introduce the next speaker, I kindly ask that you refrain from recording this session out of respect for our guests. Uh, we will be recording, uh, or we are recording this session, and it will be available sometime early next week for you to access um, as well. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of the talk if you're interested in learning more about our guests. The Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen, um, so please use that instead of the chat to ask your questions. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce our talk and our speaker. So today's talk is called um, Multi-Generational Stories of Indian School Day Schools in Ganawage. And uh, the presentation is based on Wahesu's graduate research, which examines Indian day school experiences in Ganawage through a community-centered Indigenous research methodology. What, what it is like for an uh, Ongewage, sorry, I didn't ask you how to pronounce this, uh, Ongewangwe uh, researcher to, uh, investigate, to navigate attentions in the research process around archives, oral history, tradition, and community relationships. Uh, the research centralizes the Gane Gaga life stories about navigating historic, contemporary, and multi-generational colonial traumas while demonstrating identity, reclamation, and cultural land-based education as pathways to resilience and well-being. So Wahisu Xi'an Whitebean, uh, who uses she, her pronouns, um, or she walks about, is a traditional Wolf Clan member of the Gane Gaga or Mohawk Nation at Ganawage and a mother of three. She completed her BA in First People Studies and an MA in the Individualized Program at Concordia University and served as the first Indigenous valedictorian. She's currently a PhD candidate, um, ABD, which is all but dissertation, in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill University. Wahesu is a Vanya Scholar and Tomlinson Fellow. She also works on community language and culture revitalization initiatives at the Ganawage Indigenous Education Center. Excuse me. Uh, please welcome Wahesu. What's going on? Do Nyama for having me. I'm happy to be here. So um, I cannot see the participants, so it makes it a little bit awkward. I can't even see them on my screen, um, but. You know, because of this format being online, um, I will. I do have slides, so I apologize for like talking at people. This is the way we have to do things for now. Um, so I'm gonna bring my slides up. Hopefully, I can share my screen. Oh, okay. Here we go. It's gonna allow me. Yes. Here we go. So here we go. What gunuradu So. Um, we already like introduced the, the topic here. Um, I know that I, I know a little bit about the symposium and kind of the topics that as students you all have been discussing. So I'm gonna try to um, you know start out this talk by giving a little bit of my background um, and and then unpacking a little bit about Indian day schools and then moving into um, 
that more oral history and tradition work, the, the indigenous story work that I do. Um, so I'm going to kind of start there. So what can we do? We have to your jets for Kata Huni, then no Ganamogan in the Wageno. My name is Wahesu, which means she walks about. Um, I am from Gahnawage, so I'm I'm presenting right now from home in Gahnawage. I live here with my partner and our three children. Um, and so my my entire family uh, pretty much lives here, still lives here today. And I'm Wolf Clan. Um, we have three matrilineal clans in the Ganyangohaga Nation, turtle, wolf, and bear. So I'm a, I'm a wolf, so all my children are wolves. We have a lot of clan pride, so. And that's part of our protocol when we introduce ourselves. So I think in the introduction to the talk, um, we already talked a little bit about my background being, um, you know, starting out at Concordia University. Um, I was an active Indigenous student leader on campus, so I did a lot of organizing work and things like that. Um, so I helped found two student groups, the First People Studies Member Association uh, and the Indigenous Student Council while I was there. I was also on the um, Indigenous Directions Leadership Council and one of the, the projects that I personally worked on, uh, I led the working group that developed the territorial acknowledgement for Concordia. Um, so I was the one you know, drafting and going through uh, the revision process of the acknowledgement. Um, and it's, it's somewhat unique uh, because I also prepared a whole resource document that goes with it that breaks down line for line what our rationale was for the why we worded things the way we did. So you can, um, if anyone has questions about that process, you can ask me at the end. I'm gonna try to leave some time for Q&A. And so I did coming into Concordia um, and being in First People Studies in our indigenous education class, we talked a lot about Indian residential schools and that's, that's an important history, an important topic to, to, to discuss. And I'm, I'm glad that you know, those, those truths are coming out and those stories are being heard. Um, but I was, con I was a little bit confused and upset because there was nothing about Indian day schools and other sort of um, contexts of, of education and whatnot that, uh, you know, there isn't much published about that. So that's how I got into working on Indian day schools uh, was because I grew up, I grew up in a community that had, you know, many Indian day schools and the I do have Indian residential school survivors in my family, but also the majority went to day school. And that's how I ended up, you know, just trying to put together an undergrad paper required archival research, which is out of the ordinary. Um, so then here I am today. Now I did um, all three of my degrees back to back. Uh, so I finished my master's at Concordia in the individualized program in 2019, and then jumped right into my PhD in the fall. Uh, so I'm now in the last phase of my PhD, and I'm continuing a more comprehensive study on Indian day school. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, and as a, you know, an emerging scholar, I'm more of a community scholar and community focused. And so I put more time into my community work than I do publishing and other kinds of things, because it's more important to me that, to have that on the ground kind of impact. So that's why I'm working at uh, the Gatnawag Education Center, and I do a lot I know I've put a lot of years into language revitalization. I'm a second language learner myself. So I'm also working on a community research ethics um, process to, to institute it here in our education system. So um, Indian Day Schools, I think uh, kind of a launch point would be to just briefly touch on Indian residential schools because a lot more people are more familiar with what, what a residential school is now. Um, so, you know, sometimes called boarding or industrial schools, especially in the United States. So these were places that we know there was horrific abuse and violence. And those stories, uh, difficult stories are coming out. Um, I do find that when we talk about Indian residential school, though, there is a dominant sort of meta narrative. So people know, uh, you know, certain types of stories and experiences. And this is, you know, what we think about when we think about residential school. Um, for the most part, of course, there's something you would call, I know they refer to in the settlement process, a common experience. But um, when I approach Indian day schools uh, and I will do this kind of story work with people, um, I'm not coming in looking for a certain type of narrative. I'm not coming in to prove a certain thing. It's more coming in and listening and establishing mutual respect 
and giving, you know, empowering someone to tell, to share their experience and what they think is important. So what is an Indian day school? So now that the media has kind of picked up since the settlement process ha started to, to happen a couple of years ago, um, you know, it took, it took, I think it started in 2009, um, you know, that, that whole, that whole launch of the lawsuit. So it took many years to get to the settlement part. And now they're in that stage, the media is reporting more on Indian day schools. So there's different terminology that people confuse. So I just to simplify it, I kind of have that there on the right. Um, mission schools were the early version of these Indian day schools or seasonal schools. They were operated by religious orders. Uh, and then it was more in the late 1800s that the federal government took over administering them and funding them, but they were largely ran by uh, different, you know, religious denominations. So when we use the term Indian Day School or Indian Day School student, they usually are referring to the federal Indian Day Schools. Those schools existed within or near Indigenous communities. Um, you know, there were provincial and territorial schools and they are excluded from that settlement process. And an Indian Day Scholar is something they're entirely different as well because those are students who attended a residential school but they left at the end of the day and they weren't residing or sleeping in the school and they returned home. Uh, many of those day scholars were excluded from the Indian residential school settlement agreements as well. So it's, it's a little complicated, but uh, overall they had the same objective and approach as Indian residential schools. So very similar curriculum, you know, uh, those type, types of things. So I do have a slide. Um, where I kind of like to compare, people like to do comparisons. I think it could be problematic to always be hung up on what are the differences and similarities. And sometimes you get into this conversa conversation about which one is worse. Um, and I think it's, it depends on, you know, what the lesser of evils is for people. And the fact is that these institutions should never have existed. And the fact that they existed at all is harmful. A lot of harm, harms were done to many, many children. So both were mandatory, federally funded, missionary run. So assimilation and conversion are the main focus. And these are often underfunded institutions. So you're not getting good quality buildings, usually uh, good quality food and residential schools and uh, buildings were often cold. And you'll see doing archival research on the day school, that's also common. Um, they had either an English or French language base, and depending who was running it. Once the federal government really took over administering the schools though, in the late 1800s, it was predominantly English. Um, so cultural practices are usually suppressed or forbidden. There are exceptions where they brought in some, some aspects. So that the primary differences are on the bottom in yellow. The residential schools, they located far away from communities. Um, that was to purposely remove the children from the influence and access to their family members. Whereas the Indian day schools are located within or near the community. So the children are living at residential school, but they're going home at the end of the day at Indian day school. Um, we know that there's documented um, statistics on the rates of, of, of disease, abuse, death, and so on at the Indian residential schools. We're only starting to um, unpack what was going on in Indian day schools and what the impacts of those institutions were. Um, and like, after the whole settlement process is over because um, many of the of survivors of Indian Day School submit uh, their narratives. So there, there's you know, more, more that we're learning about Indian Day Schools. And that's the research that I do. Um, so how exactly, you know, the, the, in terms of the process to, to um, apprehend children for Indian Day or residential school, it was a violent process. I mean, it was uh, traumatic and chaotic often. Um, so it wasn't until uh, the federal government really came in and, and took over and, uh, and usually around the 1920s, they started to pass in Indian Act legislation that made schooling mandatory. Um, and so what could happen is you would have, um, you know, the, the police interfere. So you could be arrested or jailed if you resisted or if your children weren't going to school. They could also withhold um, aid from families. So if you needed um, rations, let's say, because there was a widespread poverty in a lot of communities or 
reserves that were created for indigenous people. So they could withhold your your rations or later on it, it became family allowance. Uh, so that could be withheld. That was used as an incentive as well. And so this is a famous painting by um, the artist Monkman um, called The Scream. And so this is a depiction of what that was like to live through. So I do a lot of archival research. Um, well, I did the first phase of archival research for my master's. And uh, that, you know, going through web databases, um, the, the federal government was digitizing a lot of the records at the time, which made it a little bit complicated. Um, and I went into the Sisters of St. Anne Archive uh, in the in Gahnawagi Agricultural Center. And there is tensions when you're doing, you know, I come from a, um, an oral culture and um, a lot of the records are controlled and owned by the actual missionaries who ran these schools uh, or by the government. And so communities don't necessarily have open access. And so there are tensions there, tensions between that are often often created by that you're put in a dichotomous relationship between the oral and then the written, right? Um, but then also going into the archive, I didn't know what I what to expect the first time, and um, they were very cooperative, particularly the Sisters of Saint Anne. Like they were they were cooperative. Uh, they assisted me and and you know welcomed me in there. Um, but you cannot take copies of anything without permission. It's all very regimented. Um, so it was, it's a bit, there's that tension there where uh, I need to ask permission to look at photographs that, you know, of my community and our, my community members, but also my family. And I didn't know if I would come across photo, photographs of like, let's say my grandmother, for instance. Um, so, I, you know, you're navigating those kind of tensions as well doing this work. And these photos are from the Gatnawage Mugulana um, Radijoko Language and Cultural Center here in the community. I, I used a lot of their photos in the first round because I wanted to, to present things that were I knew were accessible to community members because anything from the Sisters of St. Anne archive isn't necessarily accessible. So these are all photographs from day schools in Gahnawage. The, um, the two, the, the larger photograph and the one on top are from Academy Indian Day School and those are, are date stamped. A lot of the photos that we have in our archives because there hasn't been a budget for an archivist and so on. They don't have dates and the records weren't kept well. So it's an unknown, there's a photo on the bottom of an unknown Indian day school for boys. And so going through the archives, um, you know, the Indian day school photographs look a lot like Indian residential school. Um, so this is an Indian day school in Gahnawaga Academy Indian day school, which was for girls. For a long time, they would separate the children into two groups, girls and boys, uh, according to them. And they, um, you know, I'm hoping by doing a bigger, a more comprehensive study, I'm able to see what, if there were differences at all and what they were. And yeah, so this is Academy Indian Day School. I don't, we, there was no date on the photograph. This is also from um, KOR, our cultural center. So in Gatnawagi, give you a snapshot um, you know, of, of day schooling here. There are 11 Indian day schools that had operated in the community that are on the, what they call schedule K for that, that lawsuit, the Indian day school settlement agreement. Um, and so there were those multiple schools with the earliest being a mission school that opened in 1826, which was Methodist. Um, and so that school ultimately failed. The community was largely, you know, from its inception in, in the 1600s, the Jesuits were, were present. And so um, it was largely Roman Catholic controlled. So the majority of the children in Gahnawage would have went to Catholic Indian Day School. Uh, we did have a number of children who went to an Indian residential school as well. So you had both occurring simultaneously. Um, so the Sisters of St. Anne were brought in uh, in the 19, around 1915. Uh, and that was, you know, it sparked a lot of resistance from the people at the time um, because they pushed out local teachers who were working in our school system where our language was still being taught uh, because they purposely wanted to anglicize the community. And so that's ultimately what happened after subsequent generations had to go to Indian Day School. Um, the community was anglicized and Indian Day Schools were the, the, largest, the largest contributing factor to language loss here. 
and our language is currently in a threatened or endangered state. And so the first study I did was primarily on cat and Indian day school. Um, and so we're also, many of our community members are part of the lawsuit and settlement process. So I'm gonna kind of shift a bit now um, after you know unpacking a little bit and giving a little bit of that history of day schooling to talk about um, you know who we are as a people and oh excuse me there you go who we are as a people and um, working from within our worldview and bringing that into my research and so <clears throat> it's gonna be better so, so this you know it, it's difficult to try to communicate. Um, and sum up our, our whole worldview in, in just a, a short presentation. And I like to use this quote from uh, Susan Hill, who's also Banyanko Hagamur from Grand River um, Six Nations. So this is from her book, um, which is about, uh, it's called The Clay We're Made Of, and it's a fantastic book. So th this is about being uh, Haudenosaunee or Haudenosaunee. One cannot be truly Haudenosaunee without a historical consciousness of the collective experiences of our ancestors. The very core of our existence is formed around the historic inheritance passed down through the generations. The inheritance was meant to guide the Haudenosaunee for all time as established at the time of creation. The lessons contained within our historical consciousness constitute the roadmap for a sustainable, balanced life for the current generation and the coming phases of our future. So that speaks to, um, you know, some people will say the seven generations kind of philosophy, um, but we say, you know, the coming faces, um, you know, the next generations. And on the bottom in red, it says, and that was a translation given by an elder from the community, by uh, when I asked, how do you say worldview? How would we say worldview in our language? And it means the way we examine a review of the world. So, um, so trying to do this work centered around who we are as a people is really important to me. Uh, and this is the way I move forward to do research in a way. Okay, now the slides that one on there. There you go. So um, going back now, because we're gonna I'm gonna shift into talking about um, the actual story work part. Um, so I, I, both of my parents are from Gahnawage. Um, my paternal grandfather was from a predominantly Scottish family that moved to this community when he was six years old. So he also grew up in the community. Uh, being, he was non-native, but he lived here his whole life. Um, so all of my grandparents grew up here. Um, I was fortunate having being born into a five generation family and living with my great great grandmother. So she named me Wahesu. Um, and she didn't speak English, but um, she passed away when I was only a couple years old, you know, being in her 90s. And uh, so then my first language ended up becoming English. Um, and so now I'm a second language learner, like many people in my community. But I had many sets of grandparents, great grandparents, aunties and uncles um, from different generations who, um, you know, taught me a lot about community history, about their experiences and family stories. So it was natural to me and normal to me to hear a lot of story. Um, and, you know, I also went to the longhouse. I ended up forming a really strong bond with my paternal grandmother, Millie. Um, and I spent half my childhood living with her. And so, um, you know, I grew up hearing, you know, different, different kind of uh, teachings and ceremony and doing all of that in the longhouse. Um, so that was really my foundation. And so I, you know, I knew about Indian day schools because of the stories. And I eventually heard some of the very ugly, painful stories too. Um, so, you know, when you're learning this way too with your, with elders, it's not quite, um, it's more fluid. So sometimes harms are done when we understand and approach oral history or tradition from the way it's defined and ex explained in, in Western academia, um, you know, in the way oral history has just become its own discipline and so on. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful discipline, um, but it's a little bit different in an oral culture because the lines are blurred between you know, what they would define as oral tradition or oral history. 
um, you know, it's in the longhouse, for example, in the middle of ceremony at the, at the most sacred time, you also will have speakers, uh, the elders and the title holders, um, you know, who, who would might share a dream they had or a personal experience or childhood memory. That's all kind of blended together. Just like when I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'd be with my grandmother, maybe we're cooking or working in the garden or doing whatever we're doing. And, and then it becomes a teaching. Um, you do get an ear for like when you're raised in a longhouse way um, that, or there's a certain style of oration that happens. Uh, and you can get an ear for that. So when you say, and they, they too have that background, whether it's in the family or they're in the longhouse, their style of um, giving you their sharing their memories with you and story, you, you can hear that come out um, you know, if they have that experience. So that it's more fluid when you're in an oral culture. There isn't quite a distinction between tradition and history. So based on that family history of hearing those stories, I started to use the term child target assimilation because I was trying to, you know, as a student, uh, write about these things um, and connect them as a pattern because I get to hear, you know, from all the different generations. Some had encounters in residential school, some had encounters in mean day school. Uh, and then there was the 60s school when residential schools started to fall out of favor. There was a shift made to apprehending children to put them into um, non native foster homes. Uh, and that continued today with the overrepresentation of women with children and child welfare. Um, so, you know, that there's a pattern and although there are different instances and unique experiences, they just become layered in your family. So I have, you know, examples of all of these things in my, in my family. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to be able to, instead of saying and, 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 and day school, and middle school, and, I wanted to find a way to link them all together. And just when I'm writing about, I'm talking about that pattern and that history all, all at once. So I use the term child targeted assimilation. And so um, moving more into talking about the actual story work, which is like the heart of what I do. Um, my MA thesis was called Child Targeted Assimilation on Oral History of Indian Day School Education in Gahnawage. And so that came out in 2019. And I work with four community elders, um, just happen to be elders and my committee because they limit the scope of what you can do for an MA. Wanted only three elders, but I pushed to have four and that fourth one ended up being my grandmother. Um, and so, you know, I went in based on like when they were ready to sit down and talk and they all chose to invite me into their home. So, you know, having tea at their kitchen table or sitting in their living room and wherever they were most comfortable. And then we would talk and I would explain all my motivations and what I'm doing and how things would go. And we would just have a conversation. And when they were ready, I would put the recorder on and they would know that what was recorded was what I would transcribe and what I would ultimately quote. Um, and so that's how we did it. And um, it took multiple sessions of you know, discussion and so on. And I think when you're talking about um, how, you know, intimacies in, you know, in research and in story work, um, it gets, you have to be equally vulnerable when you want to come in and work with someone and um, you're not there to extract things from a person, information or facts or just quotes, but we're there to really understand their experience and how they see it and they also do critical thinking. They, they're also there, um, you know, being able to assess how this impacted their life overall and where they are today. Uh, and it was really powerful, especially, um, you know, they open up and they get vulnerable about things they went through. And then you have to equally be vulnerable when they ask from experiences and so on. So it was a really beautiful, empowering experience. Um, and so I'm planning to do many more interviews because we have generations of living um, in the these school former students or survivors today. So I want to really talk to many more generations. So, but I'm going to draw on that, you know, first round of, of doing story work uh, today. So the elder stories, um, I, I use Joanne Archibald's book, 
indigenous story work quite a bit. It was very helpful. Um, the teachings that she has in there, the story teachings that she learned from a group of elders. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit different when you are doing your, you know, most of the story that's going to come out is, is personal experience and memory and so on. And um, so many people see that falling in the realm of oral history. Uh, I think that what's unique about coming in to, to do this work was, I don't know exactly, you don't know each person's individual experience, but this history of Indian day schooling, residential school and colonialism impacted us all. Um, and so people are at different degrees of, it might be language loss or reclaiming um, different parts of our culture. And, you know, so, so I went in with kind of with a toolkit of methods so that, you know, if the person had a more of a difficult time sharing and so on, I'd be prepared to, to ask them questions. But for the most part, the way the session went were conversations, more more like conversations in their home. Um, and so this is a quote from Joanne Archibald's book. And so it talks about that. It talks about working on, on all the levels. So some stories remind us about being whole and healthy and remind us of a traditional teaching and have relevance in our lives. Stories of the power to make our hearts, minds, and bodies and spirits work together. When we lose part of ourselves, we lose balance and harmony. Only when our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits work together do we truly have Indigenous education. So it's working together on all those levels. And that's ultimately what happened to me doing this work. Um, you know, I had to be vulnerable. And some of the elders I work with, two of them in particular, are well-known healers in the community. Um, and so they pointedly would ask things of, of me to share and open up about, you know, traumas in my family and different things that happened in my own experiences and so what I ultimately ended up doing was really understand more about cycles and where they came from and how they came into our families and a lot of them came from these schools and so the first elder uh Joe Joe um went to he started out he, he's in his 70s today he's a well-known healer he's well respected and a traditional longhouse elder in Gahnawage and so um, I had heard him speak publicly at different events about going to Indian Day School, and he had shared some details sometimes about his experience over the years. And one of his daughters are one of my best friends. So I knew him my whole life. And I asked him if he'd be willing to talk with me. Um, and so Joe and Joe said, agreed. And one day he just called me and said, come over now, you know, and so I grabbed all my stuff and went over there and we sat to talk. And, um, he said, you know, he started out at a little one room school house on the farm. And the way people talk about Gunnawage is kind of like in little regions. So in the center uh, of the village, they call the village, you know, where it was more populated and the outskirts, they call the farms. And so he lived, he came from a, f a farming family and he only spoke on Yagaha growing up. It's his first language. So he went to a little farm school and that school teacher was French. Um, so he was learning, you know, everything he was learning was in French. Um, and so, you know, the, our language was suppressed in the schools and he did talk about his fathers and uncles um, being, uh, being beaten for speaking the language when they went to, to Indian day school. So he said that the things he faced in Indian day school impacted him his entire life and and shaped who he became and I was a little bit surprised um, because I knew him you know my whole life but I didn't know you know I know him as an elder I didn't know him as a little boy and I didn't know him you know as a middle-aged person and so on so he said that he hated school so much and it was so painful for him especially the bullying because he came from the farm and many of the children in the village already could speak English or French and and he really couldn't. Um, so there was a lot of bullying, and uh, so it, and it hurt him. And he didn't do well in school. Um, so he said he used to sit in school and just wanting to be outside. And he made a decision that he was going. He would live the way he described a natural person, and he wanted to just live on land and live this different life. And he said he got all of his his history from his elders, who you know teachings and to in the language. Um, and so he becomes a natural person and then eventually, you know, a, a longhouse elder and a healer. 
And he taught me this word um, when we met, sanguayera, which he says, we should be natural people again. And he said, the way, you know, a rock rolls down off the mountain, it's left there and it's not touched, but you can just be who you are. And so, um, you know, he said, as Nguyenhoe people, we're only in our hearts in Nguyenhoe. Um, a lot of the, all those other things don't matter. And what he wants is the children to be able to have those, the experiences that he had as well to be part of their education and part of their identity. And so another elder that I work with, the second one, this is um, her photo that she provided from Katarina Day School. Her name is Gayati Dake, Annette Jacobs, and she's also the one who gave me that translation for well view. Um, so Gayati Dake had a very different experience. And so it's really important when, it, when I'm sitting and talking with elders, like one of the things, you know, Joe previously had, um, he really appreciated was I wasn't asking about painful experience or you know, or looking for like a trauma narrative. I just wanted to sit and talk about what, what his childhood and day school was like. So he had all the agency and it helped him to recall some positive memories too. So for Bayati Dake, um, she went to Kateri Indian Day School from 1949 to 1953. And she loved her time at school here. Um, she said she was a singer. She sang in the choir and she was involved in all the plays. He did a lot of plays and there used to be tour buses full of non-native people who would come and watch, watch them. They would dress them up and they would do these plays. Um, and she ultimately, you know, back then the schools went up to grade nine. And then if you want to finish high school, you go to reside at Queen of Angels for two years. And that's what a lot of girls from the community were sent to live at Queen of Angels School in Montreal. Um, she ends up getting into education and getting her bachelor's degree in education. And she's instrumental in bringing um, our language and cultural teachings back into the schools and into the curriculum. She played a big role in that. And she continues today to play a fundamental role in our language revitalization movement. And so um, Gayati Dake said that because she is a practicing Catholic and she loved her time in school, it took her a much longer time as an adult to realize the harms that Indian day school did to her um, and how wrong it was that they existed at all. And I think it's a powerful message coming from someone, you know, who as a child enjoyed their experience and then realized it was what they were doing. So she, this is a quote from our, our talk. I'm also very aware of what happened to me. I mean, I have good memories, but along with those good memories was the whole thing of, you know, what the government wanted to do and is still doing and it's still happening. Um, and so that was painful for her and being, you know, a practicing Catholic and so on and being in education. And uh, so she very strongly has been part of the reform movement in the community of education. And so Frank was um, the third person that I worked with and Gayati Dake uh, is in her, her 80s today. And, and Joe was in his 70s, and Frank uh, is in his 60s. So he was actually the youngest person that I worked with. And Frank attended Cattery Boys School. Um, and he, he said, you know, his interview was one of the most difficult to get to. I keep saying interview, but they're uh, just out of habit. But there were more sessions and conversations that we had. So I spent the day that I recorded, I spent the entire day pretty much with Frank. Um, and so he... It was a difficult conversation because um, he described a lot of the abuse and violence that he witnessed and he experienced in the schools, uh, more so than the others, than what they, they described and shared. Um, and not all of that gets recorded. Oftentimes, those conversations will happen uh, when the recorder is off because it does add a certain amount of awkwardness or tension, having any kind of recording device. And so... Um, what Frank ends up doing, you know, he, he talks about, um, he unpacks all of that and it was, it was an emotional conversation. He becomes a support worker and healer in the community as well. And he went and got a formal education in counseling. Um, and one of the things he likes to do is um, he talked about how today our children can learn, let's say, which is our, our opening address, our Thanksgiving address. They learn about these things in school. But they, many of them don't get to experience it anymore. So he likes to, to take the kids on the land to do things, to hunt or fish or just, you know, harvest things and just be on the land. Um, so he does a lot of that as a grandfather and then as a support worker over the years. 
um, and he's retired now. So this was a quote from Frank about what Indian day schools did and how he saw, he explained how he saw these cycles of violence come into the families because he wasn't the first generation um, in his family to go to day school. So he said, they give you pain and anger because they're angry when they, they beat you or yell at you. And then you go home or somewhere and it happens again. You learn that in those influential years of, of grade one to seven and or beyond, and then you do it. And he thinks that's the way it is. And that's how the cycles came into the community. And he talked about the presence of the RCMP in the community and the, there being curfews and how much control there was over people's lives at the time. And so that's what's interesting too when you look at Indian day schools because you get to see what the whole community context was at the time, what life was like. Um, you know, that all comes in, in, in the day school stories and, and how instrumental the day schools were in controlling um, families. And so the last one is my grandmother, Millie. Um, by the time I did this research, you know, I had grown up for years hearing her stories. She's in, she's in her 80s. She actually turned 88 yesterday. Um, so because of her age and also her health, it was very difficult to work with her. Um, so I limited the amount of, it took many, many sessions to have a very limited amount of um, information that I shared within the thesis about her stories. Um, but she started at Cattery Indian Day School in the 1940s. And like many families, she grew up she lived for a few years in Brooklyn because her father was an iron worker. And that's kind of a common thing here in Gautamagia. Many of them, the fathers were iron workers. Um, so when she was a little girl living in Brooklyn at that time, you know, very young, she said that um, it was very difficult in school. There was a lot of racism and social exclusion, um, and she found it unbearable. Uh, so there was a lot of bullying and things because she was Native. So um, when her family permanently moved back and she got to go to Indian day school, I think she was around nine years old, eight or nine years old. Um, she said it was like a privilege. So putting up with the little, what, you know, to her were little abuses from the nuns and, and whatnot in the school um, was more tolerable than because she got to be around her own people, at least. And that's the way she saw it. Um, and the common thread between all of the three elders one important thing was that they all had said they never shared their Indian day school stories and their memories so completely with anyone before. And I think that speaks to the fact that a lot of these stories were suppressed and not being heard. Um, you know, there is a, a big emphasis on Indian residential schools. And like I said, that's important. That's important work being done and stories that need to be heard. And then, but this whole, whole thing wasn't, um, you know, people were still keeping secrets and, um, so, you know, it was a privilege to be, for them to be so open and share with me. And so I was very careful about how I handled those stories and how I shared them. Retracing our roots, that's a term we use for reclaiming um, and revitalizing the things that were taken or were lost as a result of all this history of colonialism. So my grandmother uh, was the one, my grandma Millie, who took us back to the longhouse. Um, so we started to learn long of teachings and the traditions because of her bringing us back. And when she got named in the longhouse and ceremony, um, you know, she was already an elder by that time. When she finally got her name, uh, the name she was given was Yagote Rayantu, which means she had planted the roots because she brought us back, uh, you know, to those old ways. And um, so the photo, I have a photo of her as a little girl. She's in the middle. Um, I, I don't have many photos, but I have that one. Um, and so that was, you know, you know, it's, I'm learning about the responsibility of passing on these stories now because um, even now, because of memory loss and different things, she has a difficult time to even tell stories. And so I know I have to take on the responsibility of passing on those teachings to my kids and the kids in our family. Um, but I'm thankful to her because it was because of her that I'm on this path at all. And so uh, anytime she talks about her childhood, she talks about the river. And that was something that was common to in all of the elder stories. They wanted our children to have that aspect of education as well, living on the land, being with family and elders, getting those stories. They want that to be part of, of 
children's education because education doesn't just happen in school and schooling wasn't something that we did as a people. And so we don't want our children to have to choose because they need their livelihood and they need to thrive in this world. Um, a beautiful thing to be able to go back to my grandmother's memories of her grandparents and their family homestead on the river. They lived on the river uh, not far from this area where I took the photo. And because of the St. Lawrence Seaway project, um, our people who are really river people and chose that area because of the river to, to like stay and settle, you know, to, to stay there. Uh, we lost our, our access and our connection in some ways. And so I mentioned the day school class action, uh, the federal Indian day school class action lawsuit and settlement. I'm not affiliated with it necessarily. Um, I get asked about it a lot though, obviously, because I do day school research. So they have their own website and resources and there's many videos now about, about it. Um, but I am also a claimant in the, in, this, in the lawsuit. I already settled my claim and we have thousands of people in our community who are part of it. And I think that this is an important message for people because I know I shared some black and white photos from the archives um, and people like to think about Indian residential school or Indian day school as it was, you know, way in the past and they couch it there and it's not relevant and kind of get over it. And a lot of people make these kinds of statements, but people my age in their thirties went to Indian residential school or Indian day school. Uh, I know often, in 1996 is quoted as the when the last residential school closed but I, I've heard it's actually 1998 um, and so I started at school in Gahnawaga in the 80s in the late 80s um, and it was technically still in the day school when I started my education um, and so it's one of the reasons I show this is my class photo and my photo this is a nursery for me um, I show this photo because I like people to know there's many, many uh, living people with memory of these experiences. And this isn't something from, the, from long ago. Um, it's something we're just starting to accept and understand right now. So this is a photo of Cattery School, the one I had showed from 1928. And this is the same building. I took this photo more recently. And so the building has been you know, uh, reno a couple of times. It's still in use and it's become one of our community schools now. And so this is a common thing that if the building still exists, they might be schools and they might be used by other organizations. So Indian day schooling is a springboard into community schooling or public schooling. So I think that's another reason why those transition periods are important. So I'm part of the tra uh, transition generation where we transition from Indian day school to into community schooling. So I just like to show that like, it's the same building and it still resembles itself. And it's still difficult for people who went to this school who had, who had violin or they have painful memories to visit the school. Um, and I hear that from a lot of people, they, they have a hard time picking up their grandchildren or when elders are invited in to do stories in the classroom. It, it's triggering for people. And so the takeaways, um, like just kind of rounding us all up we can do research without re-victimizing people and I think that's very important because I don't like myself an Indian day school survivor I did start technically in an Indian day school and I am part of the settlement but I have a hard time with that language of victimization and putting myself in the same on the same uh in the same context as elders and what their experience was um by the time I came into the school there was only the last remaining um, nuns who were teaching and it was mostly lay teachers or community teachers and so my experience was very different um, so I'm still grappling person on a personal level with that um, and so you know stories and lived experiences are essential sources of knowledge when I do this kind of work and I build everything up around it instead of using someone's story or experience in an extractive way that just like to prove my hypothesis or to get my work done and take a quote. I live here. I live in this community and I know these elders and I care about them and their families. And so I have an added level of responsibility. Um, you know, I can never close that door that I opened because we know each other now in a more intimate way. And so that's really important, that level of accountability. 
Um, I avoid a damage lens and trauma narrative. I don't think it serves us in our communities. I think it's important to acknowledge and recognize that that's part of it. Um, but I like to empower people. And so I like to talk about the whole person and the whole context of what was going on on all the levels. And I can see, you know, I have that perspective of how far we've come as a people since we've gotten control of education and we're going through our own healing process. So this is more culturally appropriate and family-centered research. And because I work on community research ethics, um, we're making sure in our community, researchers can't just come in and work on an residential school or day school or anything that's a very sensitive topic. Um, much more comprehensive study now. And that means a minimum of a dozen interviews I'll be doing, uh, working with a dozen participants, I mean, or more because they're multi-generational stories. So that includes people from my generation, people my age what it was like in the transition period. And I'm focused a lot more on, on the impact of language, culture and identity transmission, um, you know, because I like to tie it into what we're doing in our language revitalization movement here in the community. So I'm just waiting, I've received community ethics approval already. I'm waiting for my REV approval and I just have that story work part and the writing to do. And I, I'm estimating two more years and I'll be done. I'll be done my PhD. And so in closing up this talk, um, this painting here was done by Oizogu, Pauline Lahash, who is who went to Indian, Indian day schools here in Gatnawage. She did this painting, it was actually at the time a commemorative painting for uh, Orin Shirt Day, honoring our Indian residential school survivors in the community. And it's called Not Just Surviving. And she wanted to depict that whole history there of the students and the school, and you have the nuns, but she's focusing on the family in the center and rebuilding those connections and, and the ways that we, where we're healing as a people that we're not just surviving anymore. And so to kind of close it all up, um, I have a quote here from Gayat Didake, one of the elders I worked with. And she said that, uh, you know, she talked about not throwing out, they have that expression, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater and that we're reforming education and repurposing it. And it's important. It's an important part of our reclamation movement. So she said, I think we're on our way, but we still like to rock the boat. And we're not happy unless we're rocking some boat. But I guess that's who we are. And that's why we're still here as a people. That's why we're still fighting and we're a force to be reckoned with. And so we've come a long way as a people through all of this history. And so I'm going to stop sharing. So I don't know if there's questions. I hope there is time for questions. Sorry about the um, internet issues. Go ahead. That's okay. These things happen. Um, so, um, uh, well, we have a question, but it's it's kind of uh, they want you to read to summarize what they missed. But uh, that's uh, that's the, the this re will be this is re being recorded right now. It will be available on uh, online um, sometime early next week, so you can um, revisit it then. Um, are there any questions? Um, I'll, I'll ask one while maybe some people are pondering. Um, because this is such a personal um, project for you in a lot of ways, um, actually probably in all ways, really, um, how do you sort of um, manage the potential um, for you know, vicarious trauma? Um, the, you know, the passing on or the, the sort of almost like the absorbing of the trauma of the people you're interviewing? What was really interesting that happened um, when I did I, when I did the first the first time I went and talked with an elder and it was Joe that was my very first one uh, a few years ago I didn't really know till that point um, if what I was doing like was I doing a good thing was I doing the right thing and all of that and how it would go and the way the sessions went I think it was it just happened that Joe was a healer right the way it went. Um, our conversations resembled my conversations with my grandmother growing up. And so I realized I became almost like a symbolic grandchild to them. So the way of community member who knows you, they don't want to do harm to you either. So there was a balance and a back and forth and unpack slowly, more slowly and carefully um, where we could, we talked out all of the issues too. So the good and the bad and everything we shared and, um, they didn't want me leaving with heaviness because we say that I'm not to leave with like a heavy heart and so on. So I realized only 
after I, I did that first talk and then Joe wanted to have basically a whole healing session with me after how important self-care was to this whole process. But I felt like if it was a relief um, because I'm already hearing these things in the community. I already heard them in my family. I already lived through it. I live with it every day. And so now we get to talk about it in a more constructive way. Uh, but it was more than anything empowering. And so I now know once I had that experience, um, I'm very careful going in. And I was so worried about not re-traumatizing them. I wasn't thinking about how it was going to affect me, but they were. And so I learned that lesson, you know, on the spot in the middle of sessions with elders that they were taking care of me too. Um, so I take that teaching in now to moving forward, doing story work. It's important. Okay, um, so one, um, I guess one student wanted clarification. Are, are Indian student day school, uh, is the Indian day school system still present and active nowadays or has it vanished? Uh, it officially stopped in 1988. So the federal Indian day schools and the settlement lawsuit that's going on, it goes up to and including 1988. And then after that, uh, they considered day schooling to be over uh, in Canada. So what they, everybody either was transferred into public education or we form community schools that are funded, still funded by governments and organizations. Um, and it depends on the community if they're run by community or not. And Gahnawage, it's a community run um, ed system we have. So there's no more Indian day schools anymore. Okay, and uh, I guess we have one last question here. I'm trying to figure out exactly what is being asked here. But um, so, with all the research you've made so far, um, what's your uh, what's your opinion in terms of um, the integration, uh, the social integration, I guess, of um, people been in, um, educated in these schools? Well, the thing is, the word. Um, it's possible that the person meant something else. So I'm mm -hmm. interpreting it this way. But the mm -hmm. word integration is a lot like assimilation. And so that word would be used in place of in, in a place of assimilation in a lot of government legislation. Uh, they'll use that word integration. It's to integrate you, you know, they don't want us having a distinct culture or society as a people. So a lot of harms were done um, that way. And so that's why we're in uh, a state of like flux right now where we're we didn't even have the freedom like when i grew up in the schools uh, i was one of the few longhouse kids who were openly traditional um because there was still so much pressure on families to be catholic and to continue the church still had a big had, role in the schools when i was there um and so there's been a big shift and there's a lot more people who are traditional and follow longhouse teachings and so it, ultimately failed the, the overall plan of assimilation and integration. Um, but, you know, it also did so much harm that our, where our language is, you know, endangered and um, the majority of our first language speakers are 70 and over now. So in the next 10 years, we're gonna lose most of them. Um, so the, that reality is there. So we're in a state like you can't heal from all of these generations of things like in my family, layers and layers of things in in a short period of time it's a lot of individual and community work and it's very difficult to heal heal from things that don't end so you're still dealing with um you know we have our 2s mmi wg you know missing and murdered that issue we still have our children uh being apprehended and put into child welfare at alarming rates and that, that kind of crisis. And you still have widespread poverty, poverty in a lot of communities uh, and those kind of different issues. It's a lot easier to heal when you have clean drinking water, right? It's a lot easier to heal when you're living a good quality of life, when you feel safe, uh, when you're not in danger just because you're, you're a female or a gender minority or two-spirit person um, and so on because you're indigenous. Um, so that, that kind of thing, you know, 
those are challenges and those are realities. And so this pattern just morphs into new things as time goes on. If we don't really stop the harms being done and we need systemic changes to happen. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to see us just integrate, you know, and, and fully assimilate and give up knowing what our elders went through to hang on to any language at all is a miracle um, and, and hang on to these practices that were literally forbidden. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but. I think it, I think it does uh, as well as it could, because uh, I'm not sure what the question was asking either, but, um, but uh, I think uh, I know you have to go up North because that's what you, uh, you do every weekend. And, uh, and I know it was kind of difficult for you to do this today. So I'd like to thank you for making the time uh, to, to be able to uh, present uh, to us today and uh, give us some very enlightening information about uh, Indian uh, day schools, uh, which I don't think a lot of people really understand the difference, understood the difference uh, about. And, and I think just giving more context about Gadawage's place in, in this kind of region that we, we live in. Um, so Waihesu, I'd like to thank you again um, and uh, take care. Yeah, well, go on for having me. Uh, so have a good day, everyone. Okay. That's how long my candy is, that's what we say. <laughs> okay.